as an African American um, who has lived most of, even though I was born in the North, who has lived most of his life, uh, my life in the South, uh, in North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. The West and West Coast is extremely new to me. And so learning about Portland's storied past with regard to racial issues has been extremely illuminating to me. Um, and, uh, in, and in many ways, uh, heartbreaking to know of this story path, but certainly illuminating to, 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 to hear it. Um, the other major resonation with me is the fact that I am an opera singer myself. That is, I was trained uh, as an opera singer uh, from undergraduate school and sought that as a career uh, in the 70s uh, when I was in school. And those of you who, who, who follow this and know this, that it's opera um, has been an extremely exclusive uh, art. Uh, and especially in the 70s as when I was when coming through, the, the, the avenues for African-Americans onto the opera stage were quite rare. Uh, many of us in the 70s who were, who were performing at the time, uh, who sought to be on the stage and, and sought to advance ourselves in our opera careers, had to, had to seek these opportunities elsewhere, primarily in Europe and in South America. Um, the, these times are changing, of course, and so it is wonderful to see these changes happening in opera houses across the country. So as I said, this, the, 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 the topic of, of, of um, anti-racism and exclusion and, exclu and, and inclusion are extremely important to me and ones that I am extremely interested in. So having said that, what I will do is uh, I will introduce our presenters this morning in order, um, starting um, with uh, Eliza, uh, who will present uh, for us and will follow with Carmen, and then Sirius will be our final speaker. Thank you very much. Um, it's a real honor to be able to join you all here today, and I appreciate the, the opportunity to speak on this subject to the audience. I will um, try to keep my remarks uh, relatively short so that we can hear from our other panelists and also have some time for Q&A. So there's a lot that I'm not going to touch on. Uh, my goal is to, to offer a few examples of some of the structures of white supremacy that have shaped Oregon uh, since the time uh, it began um, uh, being overrun by newcomers and, and around the time of statehood and since then. I do want to acknowledge that a lot of what I'll be talking about really is um, it's traumatic, it's violent, and so just want to prepare folks for that and just know that um, it might be uncomfortable and and you know depending on on your personal life you know some of it might feel really personal. So I just want to acknowledge that, um, and I also want to say that um, none of this history was inevitable, and no history is inevitable, and neither neither is the future. So there have always been um, people in Oregon who have uh, spoken out uh, for different ways of organizing things, who have spoken out against white supremacist frameworks, uh, just as there are today. Uh, so I really want to encourage folks to look for that uh, in our history and in our present as well, um, and use those examples and people um, as a way to shape our future. Um, I really think, uh, obviously, white supremacy, it's, it's built on a lie. That lie is that there's some sort of innate human hierarchy. That's ridiculous. There is no such thing. Um, and white supremacy is also anti-democratic. Uh, so to really achieve a democracy um, and a fully just and equitable society, this is something that we have to be able to see and so that we can dismantle it. So that's you know some of my purpose in speaking with you today. Um, so I want to start uh, by really uh, thinking a little bit about the, the long time and ongoing indigenous relationship uh, to the place where we are here in Oregon. No matter where you are in the Americas, you're on indigenous land. Uh, I'm here in Portland, Oregon, uh, which is the traditional homelands of the Loma, Kathlamet, Watlala bands of the Chinook, the Tualatin Kalapuya, and many other indigenous nations of the Columbia River. Uh, and what's on your screen here now is an artwork uh, that, uh, that used to sit on the, the Columbia River above uh, the village of Wishram. Uh, 
And as you can see there, this uh, She Who Watches is both a petroglyph, which is a rock etching, and a pictograph, which is a rock painting. Uh, it's also known by the name Sabalgal. Uh, and this artwork is one that Warm Springs artist Lillian Pitt uh, has used a lot in her artwork. And she has told a story about that artwork that her elders shared. And the way she introduces that story, I find instructive. Uh, she introduces the story by saying that her elders talked about it, quote, long ago when people were not yet real people, and that is when we could talk to the animals. And so this is just indicative of the, the relationship that indigenous people across Oregon continue to have with the places, the animals, the plants, the events of this landscape, uh, that, that that relationship is uh, since time immemorial and it is ongoing. Uh, and those relationships are part of the governance and economic structures that were part of what defined society and culture in this place uh, before people who carried white supremacy and capitalism and democracy and some other ideas came to the place. Uh, and those relationships continue to define uh, many of the governance and economic structures uh, for tribes and indigenous people here in Oregon today. And so when I talk about that era of new people coming to a place, oftentimes what historians talk about in that era is an era of colonialism or what we might think of as sort of traditional colonialism. And that involves uh, outsiders coming to a new place, taking resources from that place and turning them into wealth and power for themselves. And so up until about the early 1840s, this was the really the major relationship between indigenous and non-indigenous people in this region. And it's really what we think of the fur trade era in those early decades of the 1800s. And there was even some trade before 1800 and some of the uh, European and American exploration in this era. But this was really coming in and trapping those beaver and sea otter and other furs. And indigenous people engaged in relationships with those outsiders in the fur trade. Sometimes those relationships include, included intermarriage, uh, sometimes they were, they often included trade uh, and labor in some ways, but the relationships were also defined by disease and violence. Uh, and so these disease numbers of these early decades of the 18th, of the 1800s uh, in the Willamette Valley, where we are now, uh, there are estimates that up to 80 to 90% of the population was lost during, for example, malaria outbreaks in the 1830s. This disease in some ways became an excuse uh, for Americans who then did want to come and, and, and take this land for their own. And we always want to remind folks that populations can recover from disease, right? Look at the European population after the Black Plague. Populations recover. So we never want to assume that those diseases are, um, are, are just, you know, like I said, inevitable uh, and an excuse for the taking. Uh, and the era is marked disease uh, is, is one part of the genocidal relationship between the United States and Native nations in Oregon as elsewhere. Um, so then this next stage is really defined by settler colonialism. So settler colonialism is, is involves colonists not extracting resources for use elsewhere, but instead stealing the land and building their own society here. So here in Oregon, the first major overland migration took place in 1843. This is sort of seen as the, the traditional beginning of that Oregon Trail era when thousands and then tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands of newcomers came into this state. Uh, and they uh, the, the Oregon, that same year in 1843, the Oregon Provisional Government established 640 acre land claims for married couples. So this is an example of this land theft. These land claims were among the largest in the United States at that time and since. And one of the people who came overland at this time was, was Letitia Carson. Letitia Carson was a black woman who traveled here with David Carson uh, and also with their daughter, who she gave birth to as they crossed the Rocky Mountains. Uh, they came in the mid 1840s. They claimed 640 acres together and they had another child together before David died in 1852. Uh, now in 1850, two years before David died, uh, Oregon had become a territory by that time, and in 1850, the United States Congress put the force of the federal government behind those 640-acre land claims that the provisional government had established. So, and the federal government did that with legislation called the Oregon Donation Land Act, and the proviso it carried forward from the, the um, provisional government uh, 
And the Oregon Donation Land Act of 1850 granted this acreage to, and I'll quote here, every white settler or occupant of the public lands, American half-breed Indians included, above the age of 18 years, being a citizen of the United States, or having made a declaration according to law of his intention to become a citizen. So it's very clear in the language of this Donation Land Act that this land that had been stolen from indigenous people would be given to specifically white people. That um, language that you heard about half-breed Indians, just to quote again from the law, that is a nod to fur traders who had settled with indigenous wives to make sure that their sons would be able to have land. So at that time, uh, the Carson's land claim was reduced to 320 acres. We're not entirely sure why. It could be because there was not, um, there wasn't a legal marriage between Letitia and David Carson. It could be because Letitia Carson was a black woman. After David Carson died in 1852, uh, Letitia was, in, was with her two children in a territory that legally excluded her. The Oregon territorial government excluded free black people from living in the state. Uh, and it also excluded black people from owning property in the state. She stayed anyway. And we know about Letitia Carson because she took legal action she sued for her, say, her share of David's assets after his death. And on May 12, 1855, a white male jury did award her a portion. It was not anywhere near all that she sought, but it was some money that they awarded her. She at that time moved to the Cow Creek Valley and she eventually took a homestead claim. And that's the document that's on your screen right now. Uh, the Homestead Act came out in 1862 during the Civil War. Black people were eligible for homestead claims. And she took one and she owned that property until she died in 1870. Uh, so between 1850 and 1855, the Oregon Donation Land Act legalized the theft of two and a half million acres of native land by white settlers. That's about 7,000 people made those claims. This is a process that Ken Coleman, who's a historian, refers to as affirmative action for white people, right? This giving of wealth and land to white people. Now, of course, at the same time in the 1850s, uh, the United States was consumed by the fight over human bondage, whether the bondage and enslavement of human beings would be allowed to continue, whether it would be allowed to expand. And as we all know, that erupted into the Civil War in 1861. Oregon was in no way exempt from those debates. The question of whether Oregon was allowed, would allow slavery was debated by the territorial government and it was debated by the Oregon Constitutional Convention um, throughout the 1850s. And what I would say is there were sort of three, um, three different um, arguments that people made about what they wanted to see Oregon become. Uh, there was the, the slavery argument. Uh, so there on your left, we have representing the slavery argument, General Joseph Lane, for whom Lane County is named. Uh, he uh, was one of many people who argued absolutely for slavery in Oregon, big fan of enslavement. In fact, Joseph Lane was so much in favor of slavery that he ran on the Southern Democrat ticket in 1860 as, as the vice presidential candidate to John Breckinridge, who was a Southern slaveholder. Uh, that ticket came in second in Oregon in 1860 to behind the, the, the Lincoln ticket. In the middle here, we have representing uh, abolitionists who were in Oregon in the 1850s as elsewhere. Uh, two brothers, A.H. Francis and I.H. Francis, uh, were black men who had come from the Northeast and opened a mercantile store in Portland. Uh, they were legally not allowed to be in the state, um, and but at the same time, um, 200 uh, Oregonians signed a petition uh, encouraging them to stay, advocating for them to be able to stay. They lived in a sort of legal limbo, but at the time, A.H. Francis was absolutely politically active here and in California, and he wrote letters to his friend and colleague, uh, the famed abolitionist Frederick Douglass, uh, who printed many of his letters. So they give us a glimpse of Oregon for A.H. Francis at this time. And then on the right, we have uh, George H. Williams, uh, who was a proponent. He was anti-slavery in Oregon, but he was in no way opposed to slavery or a proponent of equality for Black people. He made a lengthy argument in the Oregon Statesman in July 28, 1857, just before the Oregon Constitutional Convention. He argued for Oregon to be a home to quote, free white labor. 
And this conflation of whiteness and free labor is something that is uh, prominent throughout United States history, and even I think worth considering ways in which it's prominent um, in our state and, and nation today. Um, his argument was not in opposition to slavery in the South. It was steeped in white supremacy. He argued about the higher value of white people than black people. Uh, and either he was convincing or he had a lot of company or both because that's the provision that went into the Oregon State Constitution. The constitutional drafters uh, sent three questions to the voters, uh, yes or no to the constitution, yes or no to slavery, and yes or no to free black people in the state. Uh, and by the smallest margin, the voters passed the constitution and by the widest margin, they said absolutely not to free black people in the state. So that was 1859 when Oregon became a state, that was the constitution that it came under. Uh, historian Erica Lee has a, a wonderful book out uh, called American for America for Americans, a history of xenophobia in the United States. It's worth reading because she really lays out an excellent argument in that book that our nation does not have periods of xenophobia, but yet, it, but instead that xenophobia is a defining feature of the United States throughout its history. Uh, we have this long and consistent history of prejudice against people from other places. And that prejudice is often linked to labor. As I said, noting uh, George Williams notes about the importance of free white labor in Oregon. Now, as we all know, the United States has regularly sought labor of people from outside the country while also actively denying those people economic or political rights, physical safety, or even of course, uh, their very own freedom as in the case of enslavement. In Oregon, xenophobia has presented in many ways, uh, most particularly in the 19th century in anti-Asian violence and anti-Asian policymaking. Obviously, anti-Asian violence is something that it continues to be a very big problem in our state and in our nation today. It's something that has a long and relatively consistent history uh, here in Oregon as elsewhere. Um, so Chinese people were in Oregon as early as the 1850s. Most were miners and merchants as were a lot of other people in the state at the time. That Oregon constitution I was just talking about also explicitly restricted Chinese people from voting and from property ownership. Uh, during the 1860s and 1870s, more Chinese people came to Oregon where they mined for gold and other uh, valuables, where they built businesses, worked in agriculture, worked in seafood canning, worked in domestic service. Uh, and also um, they were crucial, their label was crucial to building the railroads that then linked Oregon to, to markets and to people and to news from other places uh, in the state. And that population continued to increase in Oregon in rural and towns and cities across the state uh, until about 1900. Uh, at the same time, there was real physical violence uh, enacted on Chinese people in Oregon. The most notable example is the 1887 murder of 34 miners on the Snake River. That's the, the image on your left there is a memorial uh, in dedication to the memory of this violent act and these murdered people. Uh, that, that was dedicated, as you can see there in 2012. Uh, local white men and boys were indicted for the crime, but they were not convicted. And the murders essentially were covered up uh, for almost a century. Literally the documents about those murders were in a safe in a courthouse uh, in Eastern Oregon. And uh, journalist and now historian R. Gregory Noakes uh, was really instrumental in helping to bring that story out and make light of it. And I just wanna say that this this erasure of violence is also part of this history of violence and something that's worth um, thinking about today as we continue to look at news coverage, how violence is covered, whether it's covered, that kind of thing, um, to think about that. Uh, vigilante groups uh, destroyed property, they beat and they intimidated Chinese people in Portland and in Oregon City, uh, as well as in places across the West. And these acts of violence were matched by federal policies. So I'll give a couple examples. One uh, is the, 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 I'll give the 1870 Naturalization Act. So 1870 was the period of, of reconstruction. This is the post-Civil War period in the United States that was transformational uh, in the United States and offered the kind of promise of what the nation could be um, that we could probably talk about at length. Um, but parts of that were, one, one aspect of that was Rep Representative Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, 
uh, was proposing revisions to the Naturalization Act that would remove whiteness from a requirement for naturalized citizenship in the United States. And that had been a requirement up until this time. There was debate in the United States Congress about this delinking of whiteness and naturalized citizenship. Well, remember George Williams from his 1857 letter. By 1870, he was a senator from Oregon. And as a senator from Oregon, he was a leader among the West's delegation, which negotiated instead a restrictive naturalization act. And what did pass in 1870 was a naturalization act that disallowed naturalized citizenship for Asian immigrants. So this meant that first generation Asian immigrants could not become citizens of the United States after 1870. And that provision stayed in place. It was not removed until passage of the McCarran-Walter Act in 1952. Of course, because of the 14th Amendment, anyone born in the United States was a citizen, so second generation uh, folks were citizens. The Chinese Exclusion Act, which went into effect in 1882, was also wildly popular among white power holders in the West, was the first time that the United States actually restricted immigration explicitly based on country of origin. Now, as we know, that characteristic of natural, national immigration policy remains to this day. Um, and so that 1882 Exclusion Act was in place for many, many decades after that. Okay, um, so we wanna talk a little bit about citizenship and exclusion and really um, looking at a couple of examples here. Uh, so we know that from as early as the 1870s, Black Oregonians were advocating for full citizenship rights, including access to the ballot, as well as fairness in criminal justice systems. Uh, so I'll give you an example of uh, one couple, uh, Mary Lorinda Jane Smith Beatty and her husband, James William Beatty, were free Black people who arrived in Oregon from Kentucky in about 1864, and they quickly became community leaders. Uh, James led a committee that planned an 1870 celebration of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed, well, um, I won't say which guaranteed, because as we all know, um, guaranteed access to voting rights still is not clear, right? Uh, but the, the 15th Amendment made it illegal to restrict voting rights based on race, okay? So if you couldn't explicitly say Black people can't vote. I'm sure we could talk a lot about voting rights um, and ways that um, that voting rights have been um, oppressed for Black people and other communities, but the 15th Amendment said you can't do that, right? Um, so here we are in Oregon, 11 years after this um, constitution, which says no slavery and no Black people in the state, and you have Black leaders uh, planning a big celebration, public celebration about the 15th Amendment. Um, at that celebration, Mr. George P. Riley spoke and the advertisements of the celebration said he would speak on the colored citizen in the ballot, what he will do with it, a glimpse of our future position. Mr. Riley also argued in favor of black people serving on the police force. Two years later, uh, Mary Beatty uh, joined three local woman suffrage activists as well as Susan B. Anthony in attempting to cast a ballot in the November election in 1872. And one year later, Mary Beatty spoke at the Oregon State Woman Suffrage Convention on the subject of black women's enfranchisement. 40 years later, and this woman you see here on your left, Hattie Redmond, uh, was a leader in Oregon's finally successful campaign for woman suffrage in 1912. Uh, so she attended Mount Olivet Baptist Church. She's held suffrage meetings and lectures there. She served as president of the Colored Women's Equal Suffrage Association. She served on the State Central Campaign Committee. And after 1912, Black women, including Hattie, did register and vote and run for office and organize voters uh, here in Oregon. This other image is from much later in the 20th century. It comes from a protest in 1985 by Black Portlanders and their allies against police violence. Uh, they were responding to an incident. Uh, a policeman had killed a man named Lloyd Stevenson, who was a black man, and the police officer had used a chokehold to kill Mr. Stevenson. That's why you see that sign there that says ban the chokehold. This is the same hold the police uh, used to kill Eric Garner in New York City several years ago. On the day of Mr. Stevenson's future funeral, two police officers sold t-shirts to fellow officers bearing the slogan, don't choke them, smoke them. And the t-shirts depicted a gun on there. Um, those officers were fired, but they were eventually reinstated with back pay. Uh, 
Uh, so we know that Black Oregonians struggle and advocacy for equality in the justice system has been going on for generations. The, the leadership and the answers are right there uh, as they have been for a long time. Okay, so this is my final slide. Uh, this is from a uh, Black Lives Matter protest in June of last year in Salem, Oregon. Uh, Oregon has a racist history. Let's not have a racist future, this protester says. And um, we've been, uh, I've been fortunate to work with Dr. Daryl Milner, uh, who says to us, we are not responsible for the past, but we are responsible for our relationship with the past. And for me, I think it's very important that we all recognize these patterns of white supremacy and structural racism in Oregon's past so that we can recognize these same patterns in our present. These structures are the foundations for such realities as the disparate impact of COVID-19 on black and indigenous and other communities of color here in Oregon across the nation and many other inequities and incidents of violence that we could point to and talk about today. Uh, so my purpose here is really to just encourage you to understand this aspect of Oregon history because it's a tool that you can use in the work of identifying and dismantling white supremacy uh, here in our present. So then we can, as this protester advocates, not have a racist future. So thank you very much. That's all from me. And thank you so very much, Eliza. These are for that presentation, very sobering realities indeed. Uh, we will continue on right now uh, with a presentation from Dr. Carmen Thompson. Uh, Dr. Thompson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Leroy. Can everybody see and hear me okay? Um, thank you, Alexis Hamilton, for having me in the Portland Opera. Um, thank you for organizing this event. I'm very honored to be here with you in this distinguished panel to discuss a major problem that W.E.B. Du Bois in his 1903 book, The Souls of Black Folks, called The Color Line. The color line in which Du Bois was referring to was white racism against black people and American society's racial order that ranks white people over all other racial groups. In general, the racial categories that order American society today that ranks groups and members assigned to such groups are based on the standards and values of white people that began in Europe, when European explorers, colonizers, scientists, and leaders, who as early as the 16th century began looking for a systematic way of perceiving and interpreting differences. And what they did was begin dividing humans into presumed exclusive and unbridgeable units based on physical characteristics like skin color, hair texture, facial, facial features. And they also began imposing a value on these physical characteristics that conform to the ideological, social, and cultural values of Europeans, which is why and how we have the racial stereotypes we have today. The Europeans who invented and imposed these racial categories also ranked people and groups in these categories hierarchically based on observable physical characteristics and cultural variations with Europeans at the top and all other racial groups below them. And these Europeans began to make social, political, and economic policies based on their assessments, which is the definition of structural racism, that is social, political, and economic policies based on race. Historically, these race-based rankings and policies were used to structure American society that over time were expanded to determine access to resources like jobs, good schools, loans, where one could live or work or go to school, who one could marry, um, which today accounts for the racial inequalities that we have in nearly every sector of American life, like the wealth gap and uh, health disparities. This is racism. That is systems of oppression based on racial categories. I being an African-American woman who like Du Bois found this ranking system of white superiority and black inferiority that has governed American society since settlement in 1607 to be deeply troubling. So much so that it drove me to pursue a doctorate in US history to understand what I believe to be the key to America's racial problems, white supremacy. And by white supremacy, I'm not necessarily talking about the KKK or cross burnings, although that is part of it, nor am I simply talking about individual white people who are openly racist although that is also part of it. Specifically, I am talking about laws, policies, practices, tools, technologies, mechanisms, systems, and customs in American society that embeds white supremacy so much in our day-to-day -day lives that is literally the air we breathe. 
You've heard the term, a fish doesn't know it's in water. In the same way, we do not always consciously recognize white supremacy as the ruling organizing principle of American society. And the degree to which we are conscious of it, we either take it for granted, deny its existence, or crumble under the enormity of the problem. Now, when I use the term organizing system, again, I am talking about the policies and practices that make white supremacy seem normal, natural, and universal, just like gender norms. When someone is having a baby and we want to buy that child a piece of clothing, if it's a boy, we get blue, if it's a girl, we get pink, and, and you know, we don't even question it. Why those colors? You know, and why have gendered colors at all? Who decided on these gendered color expressions? It is clearly about power and control, and we can talk about that during the Q&A, but yet we don't even question the legitimacy of these uh, colored gendered norms. I mean, why can't their colors be a different color, you know, uh, red, black, silver? In fact, these gendered colored norms are so embedded in society, I defy you to go to a baby section in any retail store and find colors other than pink and blue, yellow, white, sometimes a soft green. All of this to say, we have these norms in society and they're all assigned um, by um, someone that is designing a system um, to keep people within a certain uh, a category of oppression. Similarly, we have the built environment, which is designed um, for the able-bodied and people of a certain height. For example, when I'm reaching up into my cupboard to get something, I almost never think of the difficulty someone with a disability or much shorter than me might have in performing this task as countertops, doorways, bathtubs, shower entryways, and handles are all designed with a standardized height and width. Just like right-handedness is the standard, the racial standard that orders American society is white. The gender standard that orders American society is male, particularly white male. The religious standard that orders American society is Christian. And the sexuality standard that orders American society is heterosexual. And all the institutions in American society reflect, promote, reproduce, and reify these standards over and over again, mostly unconsciously. And on the issue of race since childhood, I have wondered how this system was established and specifically, why do, why did do uh, white supremacist systems and many white people direct their angst against black people? And why did these systems and people enslave black people inventing the transatlantic slave trade in the 15th century, specifically for the enslavement and subjugation of black people? And since 1619, when enslaved black people were arriving in what is now the US and since the Jim Crow period from the end of the Civil War until the 20th century and to what Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow into the 20th century and today, white supremacy is the backdrop of our racial history and problems. Thus, when I went to graduate school, my PhD dissertation tried to answer these questions and the book that I'm working on, um, The Making of American Whiteness, which will be based on my dissertation research, seeks to explain the origins of American whiteness specifically and anti-blackness generally. Now, most of the books about race do not discuss the origins of American whiteness, nor do they name the racist policies and practices against black people specifically as white supremacist or the racism against black people in America as having historical origins in whiteness. Legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term intersectionality, once said, you can't solve a problem if you can't name it, and you can't see a problem if we don't frame it. My research and book attempts to both name and frame what we call race and the race problem as a problem of white supremacy, both institutionally and structurally, and in some ways individually. The manifestation of, North America, of the North American version of white supremacy began not in 1619 with the arrival of the first group of enslaved Africans in Virginia, in, but in 1607 with the arrival of the first group of European planners, investors, and indentured servants, and others who began the brutal process of colonizing Virginia. Besides the massacre and removal of Native Americans, as well as the outright theft of their lands, the making of American whiteness gained its regional coherence with wealthy planners leveraging poor and indentured Europeans to consent to their leadership and adhere to the social structures they established. In return, poor European immigrants gained the possibility of social mobility and received favored economic, political, and social status over 
indigenous and African peoples, which were, are the structural expressions of American whiteness. Thus at the precise moment that poor Europeans heeded the call to help planners and investors in the colonization of Virginia, the racial precepts inherited from the international system of slavery took on a new paradigm and shifted the, the structure of social relations from class to race with the alignment of the interest of Europeans to the expectations and quid pro quo inherent in the privileged social position whites, especially poor whites were given over non-whites in Virginia and the new world regardless of wealth for centuries to come. So instead of the usual caste-like dynamics that govern relations between poor and wealthier people in European societies, in the new world, when poor and indentured Europeans agree to relinqu relinquish their self-determination to that of wealthy planners, investors, and representatives of Virginia society, the administration of European colonialism and all its intended features was restructured to include a duty to poor whites. At once, poor whites became junior partners in the making of American whiteness, a role that was key to the entrenchment and spread of white supremacy throughout the new world. For poor Europeans, the choice to tie their fate to their wealthier, well-traveled countrymen was an easy one. Faced with all sorts of uncertainties up to and including death after immigrating to the new world, poor Europeans were wholly dependent upon European planners and investors, not only for their livelihoods, but their sheer survival. As a result, desperate European men and women would acquiesce not only to the arduous work requirements necessary for colonization, but also to the rules, values, and standards established for Virginia, even if it did not necessarily result in their gaining the level of wealth and standing enjoyed by the colony's elite. For this concession, Virginia leaders instituted legal restrictions that limited the length of their indenture, which ensured that the social position of poor Europeans would never be, low as, be as low as a slave. This policy meant that at best, Europeans would have opportunities for land ownership and good jobs, and at worst, a social position above that of enslaved Africans. Moreover, these compromises established the fundamental relations between whites, regardless of standing, that paved the way for their shared identification with whiteness. And this shared identification with the expectations of whiteness was the object around which their abiding duty to each other was secured. Therefore, willingly submitting to indentured servitude for a specified period of time did not hinder the possibilities for prosperity or whiteness for Europeans. On the contrary, temporary servitude was the price of the ticket that ensured poor European social mobility and other benefits in the new world that came with the conferral of whiteness. How exactly did European servants achieve the economic security and social position they so desperately desired with an embrace of American whiteness? The most successful in Virginia did so by emulating their masters in a belief in propriety as whites over the homeland of indigenous peoples and by assuming their superiority over African people. In doing so, they became permanent constituents of the elite and co-conspirators in the creation of American whiteness by collaborating with Virginia leaders in the theft of native people's lands and the expansion of the international system of slavery. So I locate um, the exclusion law, the black exclusion laws of Oregon that Eliza so eloquently met, uh, mentioned in the long history of expressions of whiteness that have explicit anti-black undercurrent, especially when the expectations of white privilege and advantage are perceived to not have been met. For example, the protests or riot or insurrection, however you want to call it, on January 6th at the nation's capital that saw thousands of mostly white people scale the walls of the capital to quote unquote stop the steal with all manner of weaponry and with life and death determination to take back the government with symbols like nooses and the planting of a Confederate flag in the halls of the capital, something that did not happen even during the Civil War, mostly because large numbers of Black people and other people of color in urban major urban cities and, and, and counties helped deliver Biden the victory that led to Trump being a one-term president. Also, um, we see um, the changes in the election laws that happened in Georgia, restricting eliminating um, absentee ballots, early voting and Sunday voting, the removal of ballot drop boxes, and then making it a crime to provide food or water to people standing in line. All of these are tactics and strategies that, that um, um, organ, African-American organizers used to get out the black vote that the uh, white Republican legislature trying to uh, cloak their suppression of the black vote um, um, eliminated these things or severely reducing these things in hopes to suppress the black vote. 
Other examples of expressions of whiteness and anti-blackness include all manner of fill in the blank while black, driving while black, waiting in a hotel lobby while black, shopping while black, and in the case of Breonna Taylor, sleeping while black. Um, or you have the aggressive, angry, hostile white woman we call euphemistically a Karen. Um, uh, this woman who expresses her whiteness by playing the victim against the perceived threat of a black person to her security, safety, and property simply by being in the same place as her. This speaks to ideas of race regarding belonging and access and space and place. Examples of whiteness and anti-blackness are seen in police violence against black people. We see the disproportionate use of force relative to the threat, like what we're seeing in the trial of, George, of, of the George Floyd uh, uh, murder trial happening right now. Other examples of whiteness and anti-blackness are found in attacks against black civil rights protesters in the 1960s, where you saw um, the police and other officials uh, launching attack dogs against African-Americans, high-powered spray guns, um, um, leashed out against black protesters and others simply for them um, organizing and protesting the right to vote, the right to have access to public places, um, all of these things um, unleashed upon black people um, and um, people were killed, people were beaten um, and with very little, if any, prosecution. We also have um, COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program launched by J. Edgar Hoover against people like Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, uh, the Black Panther Party, Fred Hampton. All of these people, again, were organizing for freedom and equality for Black people and access to the franchise and to public spaces. But J. Edgar Hoover saw Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and other people as a threat to the social order of the state. And Technically, they were. We were living in a society at that time of open white supremacy against Black people, open race hatred, um, and lacking access to um, the vote and to public spaces and various other aspects of segregation. And so Black people trying to then stop that or overcome that through um, protest and agitation was seen as a threat to overthrow the government. J. Edgar Hoover, whose name still is on the um, the building um, that houses the FBI launched a full-scale program called COINTELPRO or counterintelligence program to stop that and infiltrate Black organizations um, to stop the process of Black freedom. Of course, we have the Civil War um, in 1861 to 1865 is an example of whiteness, white frustration mixed with any Blackness that in that slavery uh, was um, in the Civil War was about slavery and white people uniting against the federal government, telling them what to do with their enslaved property and the refusal to accept the humanity and, quality, in, and equality of black people. After the Civil War, you have Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, where you see uh, white backlash to black equality and the rise of the KKK. You have the American Revolution that was about white frustration mixed with any blackness fears of rebellion by enslaved Blacks going to the British side, and the fear of Black people striking out for their own freedom using the language of liberty united the white population behind the patriot cause of liberty and revolution against British rule. Finally, examples of whiteness and, and white frustrations are found in Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, where poor and indentured Europeans upset with the government for not allowing their unfettered propriety to native lands like white elites and large numbers and large planters had. So although this is not an exclusive list, it, spe it speaks to the long history of white supremacy in the United States since settlement. Lastly, I wanna say that if you are white, you do not need to be defensive about the system of white supremacy that governs our society and its role in the racial problems that are a result of this history. That said, you, we, all of us are responsible for what we do with the knowledge of this history and how we behave. Hopefully the goal is to try to create a just and equitable society for, for the world and for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thompson. Uh, we will move on quickly to uh, Sirius Bonner. Hi hey everyone, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to the Portland Opera and thank you to this lovely audience. Um, I will uh, essentially skip my comments and keep them as ex extremely brief so that there's an opportunity for Q and A. Um, and I will just shorten everything I was going to say by saying that everything 
that Eliza and Carmen shared is 100% true. It is a fraction of the truth. Um, and there's so much more to these stories and it continues on to this day. Um, it is really important to understand how some of that history is connected to everything that we're seeing right now within the state of Oregon with Portland um, in our region, our sort of wider Pacific Northwest region. And it shows up in so many different ways. Um, housing disparity, education, uh, flaws in our education system, healthcare, health inequities, um, all of these places show deep, deep inequities that are rooted in almost exclusively white supremacy, but not limited to white supremacy. There's also some issues around gender, sexuality, so, you know, it, the list goes on and on, but it's so important to understand the ways in which white supremacy is still playing a very um, intense role in shaping the world that we maneuver through today, right now. Um, there are numerous of examples around sort of COVID, the way that we've seen different institutions deal with COVID, even within our state, our inability to, we, to know very clearly that marginalized communities of color, particularly black and brown communities, are at the forefront for um, being the most vulnerable around COVID and our inability to prioritize those communities when it came to the vaccine is a clear example of the ways in which white supremacy won't let us do the right thing, even when we see the wrong thing happening before our eyes. So, um, you know, again, just, just another small example of the ways in which white supremacy have a deep history and are continuing to shape uh, what's going on in our current community. I'll just, I'll stop there. Oh, sorry, one more thing that I will say, uh, and this is just something I've been sharing with a lot of different audiences I've been working with lately. But if we understand that um, uh, police are detrimental and uh, scary and uh, murderous around black men, um, and that is our understanding of the relationship between black men and, the po and police, we have to start also understanding that the relationship between black women and doctors in the medical industrial complex is very similar. Um, and until we can start having that conversation, uh, which is a very difficult and scary one, but, but the truth is that black women are um, at extremely high risk for uh, medical discrimination and the impact of that around um, disparate care, death, um, and, and cascading sorts of issues around that as well. So, all right, I'll pause. Sirius, if you could speak a little bit more about those um, intersections of, of patriarchy and white supremacy and, and other aspects of, of inequality, particularly as they relate to um, health and, and people's health, as you were just alluding to, would you be interested in speaking a little bit more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a really important conversation. So um, in the work that I do, uh, we do a lot of training with our staff and, and doing some training outside of that context as well. We often talk about the big three, uh, that is white supremacy, patriarchy, and capitalism as the three sort of interlocking oppressions that um, that manage our everyday lives in, in particularly United States context. So if you're looking at any kind of oppression, um, it's going to probably come back to one of those three issues. And uh, that's really important to understand because, um, especially in something like healthcare, if you are a person who has multiple intersecting identities, you might be sitting there thinking, okay, am I getting um, ill treatment in this context because I'm Black or because I'm a woman or because I'm queer or because I'm disabled? And the answer is it's all of those things and they're amplified because they're intersecting. Um, and so the idea that um, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult to sort of tease, tease these different pieces out or to think of them as one could be worse than the other. Um, that's almost a fool's errand. We just don't even go down that path. The issue is being able to identify that there are often multiple layers of oppression at play in any given situation and that they are all intersecting. Um, but understanding that, that it's, it's understanding that there are multiple layers is really important. Uh, the, the United States racial history and racial past is, is no, it's, of course it's no secret. It, uh, this country was founded upon um, the, the, the white supremacist belief that they were superior to others and, and the fact that they would, they, they would own slaves in, in order to create the, the environment that they 
find themselves living in even, even now. And white uh, supremacy is, is, is something that's huge in the South. We grew up with it. I, as, a, as a child of, of uh, as I say, born in New York, but lived in North Carolina all, almost all of my life because my grandmother was there. Um, the, the, that standard of norms of white supremacy that you just sort of lived with day in and day out unless you challenged it were, were front and center in, anyone, in, in everyone's face. But I find myself, and I've, I found myself being extremely surprised by Oregon's racial past and the, and the horrific things that I have found out since discovering uh, Oregon, if you will. And I'm wondering why that is so and how that came to be and how is, has Oregon become so good at keeping its secret a secret? Well, it's such a great question. And I think probably what I've learned about that has been, um, you know, from, from the history that I've had the opportunity to learn, but also from listening to um, Black community leaders and other community leaders of color and activists who I think have really taught me to understand Portland and Oregon better. And just um, there are people talk about the Portland nice, you know, which is not really nice. And I think, um, you know, I'm from the mid Atlantic, you know, we may have kin from North Carolina, you know, so I think <laughs> that, you know, it's just much more. Um, I heard a historian talk about it once that that in the South, that there is there's a more physical proximity between white folks and black folks, people live together and work together in many ways. Um, and there's a very clear segregation of political power, right? That is that is obvious and it's clear. And when it's broken through, um, people are, are talking about it very directly, right? And in the North, um, the North is much more uh, segregated in its political power. And in the North, we pretend that it's not, right? And so we pretend it's sort of like, um, if you look at the way Northern cities responded to Brown versus Board of Education, right? They said, oh, well, we don't segregate our schools. This doesn't apply to us because we're not explicitly segregating. But Northern cities like Portland segregates where people live, segregates through um, uh, redlining and restrictive covenants and other kinds of things, right? So you saw for decades in Portland, black leadership saying, of course these schools are segregated, right? And the Portland School Board saying, well, I think we better commission our own study to figure this out, right? So I think that um, in many ways, Portland is like other Northern cities, but then I think it's different because there was this attitude of progressive Republican leadership in the later 20th century. I think Portland got good at some conservation and environmental conservation. And so use that as a way to talk about it, it use it as a way to foster a pro progressive uh, reputation. Um, and what uh, the city never did during that same time period, right? This is the same, this, the, the 60s and 70s and 80s at the same time period as you have uh, police killings and school segregation and all these kinds of things that are happening here. But that doesn't come into the Oregon story about Tom McCall and Governor Hatfield and the protection you know, the, the cleaning up the pollution of the Willamette River or institutionalizing recycling or that kind of thing. Um, so I think that really um, Portland and Oregon has just sort of lied to itself, the white people. I mean, I, all you have to do is listen to what black people and, and indigenous people and other people of color have to say about what Portland is and it becomes, you know, it's very clear. So I don't know if I answered your questions, but those are the kinds of things that I think about when that question comes up. Um, and, and the other thing I will say is this that I've heard, um, you know, and I think Reverend Leroy Haynes talks about this. He did a wonderful oral history that's, that OHS has available. And he says, well, Portland, I was happy to talk, happy to talk, happy to talk about the issues, happy to talk about racism. And so then it's that action part that, that doesn't that doesn't happen. Well, let's study it. Let's commission a study, right? And so I think that's where things get stuck in Portland because um, we talk and don't do. Oh. That's, oh. I, that's my, my thoughts on it. <laughs> I, 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 well, and, I, and I appreciate those thoughts. I mean, I, I, they, as I said, it, it's, it, I, I, I found that I, I 
I couldn't decide whether or not I thought that, or, that the Oregonians were so clever at, of marketers that they were actually able to keep their secret or whether it was just simply the, oh, yeah. the, 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 the alignment of the planets and that. I, just... I think, it's, but I would remind folks that within the past 20 years, the state of Oregon outlawed marriage of same-sex couples, right? Pass, so, so don't tell me we're a progressive state <laughs> when the majority of voters would put this measure into place mm -hmm. that then had to be overturned by the courts, right? So I think it's, it's a, it's, we'll talk this direction and just ignore what's on this side, right? Yeah. So. Well, well, thank you for that. I've sure. got another question from, uh, uh, from one of our audience members, uh, and this is for everyone. Um, what should be the priorities for leaders in the performing arts in order to affect sub substantive change in, here in Portland and in Oregon? And I will throw that out to anyone who's willing to ask a serious. Yeah, I, you know, uh, not being in the performing arts myself, but having a, a real love for um, culture um, and media, I, I really, really think it's important to start moving beyond conversations around diversity. Um, diversity and representation are important. They are a critical step but there has to be more to it than that. We have to start looking at conversations around, uh, you know, for lack of a better term, lack of better terms, inclusions and equity, right? Those are really important. But um, just having more brown people in a cast or um, a writer in the room or those sorts of things, that's not often going to solve the problem. And so we have to think more about what stories are we telling? How are we telling them? Who's telling them? Where's the authenticity? How are we holding ourselves accountable? Are we listening to the communities that we're trying to include? Those sorts of questions have to be really front of mind. And it's not just about, well, um, how do we get more, more actors? How do we get more brown actors? Like it did just, the conversations around diversity have to evolve to the next level because, um, as as we know, that conversation is not getting us to the uh, in the results that we want. Thank you, and I would absolutely agree with that. These conversations have to get bigger, as you say. I mean, and they have to take in into consideration the the community and the need of the community. We definitely have to be more in touch. Um, I'm, the Next question we have um, is, um, how do you think that uh, Oreg the, the Oregon's brand of racism has fractured the Black community here? And I think that that was sort of touched on before, but uh, I, I would be interested in, 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 the, in the views of, of all of the panelists regarding that question. I, you know, honestly, I have a lot to say about that. Um, <laughs> but I just, I will say, I will say two small things that I think are elusive of this. Um, a couple of years ago, I was at an Urban League dinner and the leader of the Urban League at the time, this is I think in 2007, said that in Oregon, um, Oregonians care more about salmon and dogs and bikes than they do about black people. Uh, nothing has changed since 2007. I think that that statement still stands as true. Um, and I think how we see that playing out is we think about the ways in which biking has been a, a, a displacer of Black people in North and Northeast Portland, um, Mississippi and Vancouver uh, streets in particular, and the ways in which there were already displacement and gentrification happening in those areas that pushed people out to East Portland. Um, and how biking became a further push for folks um, or a further thing to say, we care less about you than making sure people can have, um, can bike safely, right? So that's, I think, one anecdote. I think another interesting thing to think about is um, a few years back, some of you may remember this, there was some conversations around whether um, Oregon or Portland is a, a white utopia. And um, I think for me, the biggest piece of evidence was there were white supremacist groups and white supremacist leaders who were saying things like, Oregon, they're doing in Oregon what we've always wanted to do. And they're doing it themselves. We didn't have to come in and do that. We didn't have to come in and, 
and um, you know, be extremely racist and displace people and do all the things. The Oregon like uh, ethos and vibe and all of that in Portland, like they're just doing it themselves. They're creating a white utopia and we don't even have to get involved. So let's just let them do that thing that they're doing. And in about three years, we can come in and really do what we want to do. And so I, I would guess we're about eh, maybe a year away from that three year timeline. So just um, th those are two things that I think about in terms of like how, how the Oregon specifically is displacing or hurting black people. Thank you. Uh, uh, Carmen, do you, do you have thoughts on that subject? Sirius did such a good job in, in talking about um, uh, these variety of issues, um, particularly, I think, around um, you know the gentrification that has occurred um, because of uh, transportation and biking. I think that uh, the perspective that this city has about um, um, either um, biking, for example, and I'll just stay with that. Um, is really an elitist kind of perspective because everybody can't bike to work. Um, everyone doesn't have the ability to um, ride their bike into work and, and go various places around the city. They might have to drop kids off at school. They might have to usher family members and parents to appointments. It's this attitude that um, everyone has that type of flexibility both in the workplace um, and um, at home. And um, oftentimes the people with the less, least amount of flexibility are, are people of color and, and black people in particularly, particularly in Northeast Portland as Sirius so eloquently mentioned. And, and that has caused then the fracturing of the black community um, around this issue of bike that I think um, is not getting enough attention. And, but I think it's really important because it's added another layer um, to um, the um, gentrification of, of the Black community and the fracturing of the Black community such that you see Black people then being pushed out into what we call the numbers now um, and, and kind of leaving um, North and Northeast Portland kind of available for um, the young, young, and young and up and coming white people that are moving to Portland and, and further pushing out the Black community um, into the numbers where people don't have the opportunity to um, you know, interact with their community um, and to the degree that they were in North and Northeast Portland, but also to, you know, the lack of access to good uh, public transportation going out to that, those areas in the numbers, um, the lack of jobs, and then again, connectedness to churches and various other things that may have kind of been um, fractured out that are important and vital to the Black community and to other civic organizations. And it's kind of like spread um, the Black community in particular, um, uh, across, further and further outside of the metropolitan area or further out into East Portland and other areas um, without the supports and infrastructure um, that um, is very important to um, creating a thriving, you know, lively community that once was had in North and Northeast Portland, so. Thank you. And finally, uh, Eliza, do you have any final thoughts on this question? No, I can't, I can't imagine I could add anything to okay. what said, so I'll just offer appreciation for those statements. All right, thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you all three. Well, as we, as we wrap up this conversation, uh, we, uh, I, I was thinking to myself as you all were, were speaking that we could go on with this conversation for, uh, for hours because it's, it, this is, these, these are important topics that, that We've just scratched the surface of you know Oregon's Oregon's racist and horrific past, as well as its 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 very troubling present that is guiding our future and and uh, and we have to be very careful and cognizant of, of these signs. Are we will be heading uh, towards that future that uh, uh, that Sirius was 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 uh, describing to us, you know, we're we're doing the work for the for the white supremacists ourselves, and, and unless we unless we, uh, in some ways in our thinking, don't stop that, uh, we're headed for a future that is 
it's not going to be a very bright one uh, as far as race and race relations is concerned. Um, so I want to thank all three of you again for this very, very rich conversation. And I also want to thank um, the Portland Opera for the opportunity to have this type of panel discussion. And I want to invite uh, all of you all who are on uh, this conversation uh, to please uh, tune in uh, to the uh, Opera on Screen productions of Journey into Justice that are coming your way. And for more information about that, please go to the website at www.portlandopera.org. Excuse me, it's portlandopera.org uh, for more information about this. And uh, with that said, I want to thank again our, our three panelists, uh, Carmen Thompson, uh, Eliza Canty Jones and Sirius Bonner for these excellent presentations and for this very rich conversation. And with that, I thank you all for coming and I'll end this uh, conversation in this panel discussion. Thank you, everyone.